The Orientalist by Tom Rice tells the story of Lev Nussenbaum, a Jewish writer who transformed himself into a Muslim prince and then became a best-selling author in Nazi Germany. Part history and part cultural biography, this book is also a literary detective story, uncovering the remarkable truth about an extraordinary man. I had discovered the mystery of Kurban Said when I went to Baku in 1998 to write a piece about the oil boom there on the Caspian Sea. And somebody recommended that I take along, in place of a guidebook, this old novel from the 1930s called Ali and Nino, a kind of Romeo and Juliet story set in Baku at the time of the Russian Revolution. And it was a fascinating book, but what really fascinated me was that I realized nobody in Baku knew the identity of this author, Kurban Said, and yet they said he was their great author, the Shakespeare of Azerbaijan. I found out that he had had um, a life that was more incredible than anything in, in that novel or in any of his books. His life was really something beyond fiction. I came upon this photograph of this little boy with this round face and these very intense eyes, which turned out to be Lev Nussenbaum, that boy who would become Kurban Said. Lev Nussenbaum had built up this identity as a Muslim prince and a desert warrior. This identity was based on a, a fiction, but also on a truth. Lev Nussenbaum was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, a hundred years ago, 1905, during the first revolution in Baku. Baku was a kind of incredible cosmopolitan capitalist city. It was the economic juggernaut of the Russian Empire. And Baku was this remarkable crossroads of East and West. Lev Nussenbaum was born into this incredibly cosmopolitan culture. The first photograph of him happened to be at this Christmas party that was a Muslim Jewish Christmas party. They got together around a Christmas tree, and that, to me, captured the flavor of the city, which was one where all religions and races got along before it all collapsed horribly in the Russian Revolution. Lev Nussenbaum escaped the Russian Revolution on a camel caravan with his father, Abraham, and they were trying to get to Afghanistan, but they didn't get to Afghanistan, but they got halfway across on the desert of Turkestan. Then they had to go south through Persia, and they finally ended up in Constantinople in 1921. It had become this kind of incredible um, multi national city and then from there they made their way through Italy to Paris and then in Paris they made a fateful decision when Lev was 15 years old they decided to move to Berlin just at the beginning of the rise of the Nazi period and he's put into a high school which is mostly filled with Jewish refugees from the Russian Revolution and he decides that instead of being a Jewish refugee he will tell all of his other students that I am Esad Bey the lost prince of the East now, they all know that he's really Lev Nussenbaum. That's what it says on his school papers. But he starts to dress up in a turban and uh, starts to bring a dagger in his belt to school. And then the fantasy becomes very real. When Lev is 24 years old, he publishes his autobiography, Blood and Oil in the Orient, which is the story of his adventures escaping the revolution, only it's as much his invention as the reality. This penniless Jewish refugee suddenly is catapulted onto the world stage. From then on, he is the lost Muslim prince of the East, and the rest of his life he lives out trying to um, stay true to what he wrote. The story of his escape across Central Asia, Persia, and the Caucasus, which is told in Blood and Oil, almost certainly contains some zealig-like maneuverings of space and time to place him at the scene of some of the most dramatic confrontations of the Russian Civil War, 
like the siege of the Georgian city of Ganja, where 13-year-old Lev supposedly manned a machine gun and was captured by the Cheka. At the heart, the journey functioned as a myth. Even if most of the details were true, it was Lev's original Orientalist myth of himself. Lev was an incredible writer in many senses, but also just in the sense of his productivity. He wrote the world's first important biography of Stalin. He wrote that the Stalin that he knew through his mother when he was a kid in Baku had run Baku like Al Capone had run Chicago. And he also wrote these books like The Twelve Secrets of the Caucasus, where he creates this entire alternate reality of worlds within worlds in the Caucasus that are unreachable by anybody in the West. In the mid-1930s, Lev was at the height of his fame. And in fact, he had become very famous in the US. And his, he had moved his family first to Park Avenue and then to Hollywood. And he could have just stayed there and lived out this fantasy of a kind of Hollywood Valentino Muslim prince. A typical profile that ran of Lev in the New York Herald Tribune in 1934 showed a photograph of him wearing a Caucasian mountaineer costume. He had a high wool cap, a bandolier, and a dagger thrust in his belt. Beneath the photo, a caption proclaimed, Esad Bey, he hates trouble, but he's ready for anything. This was exactly when Lev decided to return to fascist Europe and hatch this crazy scheme, one of many in his life, but perhaps the craziest and most suicidal, he decided that he would get close to Mussolini's inner circle and become Mussolini's official biographer. Lev was married briefly in the 1930s, but the marriage collapsed in a terrible tabloid divorce in 1938. I think that the scandal was perfectly captured by something that his wife said to the New York Daily News. She said, when we got married, he told me he was a Muslim prince. But I found out shortly after our marriage that he was just plain old Leo Nussenbaum. At the time, Lev was in fascist Italy, in fact, very close to Mussolini's inner circle. And so sending this news out in the American press was like sending over a kind of death warrant. In the late 1930s, the Gestapo had so fully investigated Prince Esad Bey that his name was synonymous in Germany now with the Jew Lev Nussenbaum, with the famous Jewish swindler who everybody wanted to catch. So the name Esad Bey by the late 1930s was too hot to use. And it was then that Lev created another fictional Muslim name for himself, which was Kurban Saeed, and he took this name, as I found out from letters of his that I found, he took this name because it meant joyful sacrifice. And so it was a kind of ironic gesture. He knew that the game was up for him in a way, but that he was going to keep writing to the end. Lev died in incredible pain in 1942 in Positano. Up until the moment he died, he never stopped writing. And in the letters and in the notebooks, though he said he was going to tell the truth of his life in the face of death, what he did is instead, I found, keep creating more and more new identities to jump inside. What really attracted me to Lev Nussenbaum, perhaps more than his writing, was the way that he kept recreating his own identity and made himself into a kind of literary Houdini, someone who played games with race and religion at a time when both those things were really as fixed as a death sentence, and did so with a kind of reckless courage and imagination that seems impossible but was really his strange fate.